sure seems like that. I, I definitely felt like since the news happened with the T building, I was like, well, we made the right call <laughs> getting out in front of this a little bit. Um, but yeah, um, let, let's get started here. It, oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, uh, just a quick announcement here. Um, and for anyone who's watching this on YouTube later, if you're having trouble, uh, with the connections again, please let me know as soon as you're having those issues, even on the fly. Um, and we can try to do what we can to help you get connected. Being present live, I think, has value, um, not just for you, but for everybody in the class. And I want to encourage this as much as possible. Just to clarify uh, and emphasize a couple things from what I was saying in the email before about how this is all going to work um, logistically. To get connected to the live chat, you need to have Skype for Business, which is the account that the school has uh, contracted with that lets us do these. Like, you can have Skype, right, and make Skype calls. But to be involved in these like big calls that have that can have dozens of participants, you need a special program for that, and that's Skype for Business. And uh, in a business or institution like Bellevue College needs to have an account to be able to have access to this technology. Um, it's kind of proprietary, <laughs> so uh, or there's just the gatekeeping on it. And so you need to have Skype for Business and use your Bellevue College login information in order to get connected. Um, that was uh, something that was uh, a wrinkle that, that um, I wanted to make sure everyone was informed about. Um, so there's that. Any other um, complications or things people can report about our transition and maybe that might be helpful to some other students who are, who are trying to navigate the same space or just anything that you want help with or that you've got questions about? Nope. Anyone else in chat? We got 21 people here today. I'm so happy to see that. Thank you all for being here. How's the how's stuff go with the quiz yesterday? Everything on Canvas making sense in terms of what you need to be doing? Yes, so attendance for these live lectures um, or for watching on YouTube later is confirmed by putting the code word that I give out during the, the lecture into a attendance quiz, which is on Canvas. So you might have seen before on your Canvas grades how I give credit for the, you know, the whole first part of the quarter. I would just manually take attendance and give you credit for it. Now those assignments that are plugged into your Canvas grades um, have a little quiz to them uh, where you just go in and it's just a simple question that says what's the code word and you plug it in and then I grade it later because I have to do that manually it's not automatically graded um, but like last night at midnight before going to bed I um, I went through and and graded all the submissions that were made so far and, and I will continue to do that for the ones that come a little later too um, is that system making sense yeah okay Anyone else have questions or complications? I know I might sound like a broken record on this, but um, for us to do this and pull it off in an ideal way, I, I think a lot of it really does depend on all of my students like helping me to know what you're dealing with and putting stuff on my radar so I can be responsive to it. I really want to be. Um, and that's your your assistance in that is really important and appreciated. Um, I did have uh, one other note here. Uh, so yesterday, I, and I made a post about this too. Um, the Tuesday lab time, I'm still planning on holding those, um, and I did hold it yesterday. It was the same link from the video lecture that I had earlier yesterday. Um, I had one student show up, <laughs> and I was wondering if there would be anybody else, but um, I'll do, I'm planning on doing that again next week, too, on Tuesday. And we might even schedule some extra sessions here, uh, like uh, when we've got exam two happening next week. So th those opportunities will be available, and, um, and I, I want people to use them. I, I wasn't sure whether people who would have wanted to attend the lab if we had done it on campus just didn't know how to get connected or, or didn't know that it was happening or something like that. But 
um, all the usual way in which I want to be available and accessible to students applies in this online format too. Okay, should we get started? Yeah. Anyone else have anything? Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to pull up our little whiteboard. Again, if you have the Lecture 5 uh, lecture notes uh, from Canvas files, that might be a good thing to be referencing as we continue here. Um, but I've got this, uh, let me pull it up. I had that little Microsoft Paint whiteboard thing that we were looking at yesterday for statistical generalizations. And we have a little bit more to talk about in terms of the evaluations of the generalizations, and then we're going to be talking about applications today, too. Um, but applications are going to look very familiar from what ha is happening with um, generalizations. Okay, my computer is being a little goofy here. There we go. Let's share this. All right, someone let me know when you're able to see it. Not happening yet. Yeah, it says it's connecting. All right, is it right now? Got it? Coming up? Got it. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> sweet, thank you. Um, so we have, uh, we talked about sample size yesterday. We talked about sample bias and the, the sort of nuances for it. Um, and then we started talking about bias in investigation and bias in interpretation. And the kind of key idea here is introducing into the system this other element of what's happening with the statistical generalization, and that's this data component. So if you recall from yesterday, we were talking about how in many cases of doing a generalization, it's fairly straightforward, like the, um, the case of polling people to see how they're going to vote. I mean, there's not a lot of ambiguity here in how you're collecting the data to observe what's going on with the sample. You just ask people, like, are you going to vote for this person or this person or for this party or this party or whatever? Um, and then they mark it, and then I interpreting that response from them is not complicated. It's very straightforward. Um, but in other cases, it is going to be more complicated. And I was using that example yesterday of a, a sociological study where... Uh, you can't just ask people directly. You might not get data that's actually reflective of what's truly happening for the sample. Or I was also using an example of doing, say, a physics lab or, or a chemistry lab or something. And your instrumentation that you're using to observe what's happening with the experiment, which is your sample that you're observing, um, if, that's, if that instrument is not calibrated, then you've got bias in investigation too. Uh, because the instrument is returning a distorted picture of what's actually happening for the sample. So the question about bias and investigation is always about whether the data being collected, the way of observing the sample, if there's any concerns about that method of observation resulting in a distorted understanding of what is actually happening for the sample. That's the main thing that is relevant here um, with bias and investigation. Um, do you have any questions about this uh, chat? Did that idea come through pretty good yesterday? Anything you're you're maybe wondering about or confused about with that that standard of evaluation here? Yes, question. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. 
So for those of you watching this on YouTube later who weren't able to hear um, Jose's question here, the, the question is about distinguishing sample bias from bias in investigation. And here's the quickest way I can do it. Sample bias is about how we're so, which things of the reference class are we observing. Bias in investigation is how we observe that group. So how we try to figure it out. So for example, let's go to this example I was using yesterday about the sociological experiment or the investigation about sexual deviance. It would be a concern if my sample, the, the people, uh, this was for Bellevue College students, the reference class was Bellevue College students. Depending on who I'm looking at in that population, there could be a concern about sample bias. Like, if I'm only talking to people who oh, I don't know, um, have uh, conservative religious upbringings. Now that's going to be, a, not everyone in the reference class shares that feature, and that feature, the way in which the sample is not representative, probably is relevant to the property in question, right? So th there's a concern there. But let's say I have a sample that doesn't have any sample bias in it. I can't just put all those people in a room and look at them and see if they're sexual deviants or not, right? I'm going to have to gain some window of observation into what's happening for them, um, and that's what makes bias and investigation different than sample bias. Sample bias is what I'm looking at, and bias and investigation is how am I looking at that, the, at that thing or that set of things or people. Is that is that helping you, helping you, Jose? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, so here, here's some other examples. Um, you might have noticed on Canvas that the instructor evaluations are up, which I strongly encourage you to do. Uh, that getting that just as a side note here, uh, getting feedback from students about my teaching is super, super important, um, and it's always a, a endless learning process for me. I've been teaching for ten years, but I'm always getting better at this kind of thing. There's always new things to be tracking, and hearing about what works and what doesn't work for you. Um, and just what your experience is with the class and, and with me is something I, I really value. Um, but this is in itself uh, a kind of investigation similar to a statistical generalization. If only a few students respond to the instructor evaluation, then we're going to have a sample size problem. I can't maybe meaningfully generalize. Uh, maybe you've heard the whole adage about how the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, I remember the first year of teaching, I got my instructor evaluations after the first semester, actually. And I was like, oh, shit, OK, I've got to switch this stuff up because these people were complaining about it. And then I did that. And then I had complaints the next quarter about the changes I'd made. So um, when, it's, when I have a small sample size, I'm not in as good of a position to tell overall what's happening for all of my students. So that would be a concern about sample size. There could also be a concern about sample bias in this as well. Like, uh, usually the students that respond to um, instructor evaluations are either people who really liked the class or did really well in it, or the people who really didn't like the class or didn't do well in it. And then there's going to be a whole lot of opinions that are lost, right? We're going to get a distorted picture of what's happening for the reference class um, because the people who have returned results that we have data about are not maybe sufficiently representative of the reference class. Okay, how about bias and investigation though? I wanted to bring up this example specifically to illustrate that. If I just went to you in person or even even over the phone here like this on a video chat and I was like, um, do you think I'm a good teacher? This is probably not the best way to collect data about the sample, right? Would, 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 would you agree? <laughs> is there a concern about the way that I'm trying to observe my students when I just ask them directly, do you think I'm a good teacher? And if so, what do you think was the problem with that? Where, where would there be a concern about bias or a distorting effect? People are uncomfortable being up front. I love that answer. That's great. Yep. Um, you're you're going to be under a social pressure. You don't want to piss me off. Um, yeah, asking it that way would put someone in a position to try to answer maybe more positively. Like, because you, you don't want to offend someone or make them feel bad or something like that. Which is why 
the instructor evaluations not only are anonymous, which is very important, but they also uh, are things that I'm not able. Oh yeah, and Andrew put in fear of repercussion or reprisal, right? That I'm, it's going to affect my my grading for you or something like that. And that's why the instructor evaluations, even though they're also anonymous, I don't get to see them until after final grades are submitted. So they can't influence the way that I'm going to treat you with the power I have over your grade. Right? So all of those features to the instructor evaluations are designed to try to prevent bias in investigation and getting skewed data. Okay? So there could be a lot of different sources of bias in investigation. Like this category includes everything from social fear to uh, things like faulty instruments. So anything that's a matter of how we're observing the sample and getting data that doesn't accurately reflect what's truly happening with the sample, any fears we have about this would fall under bias and investigation. And I have one final point about this before we move on. Um, this is going to be true for bias and interpretation too. Figuring out whether there is bias and investigation or bias and interpretation is usually a speculative judgment call. You're not you're very, it's not going to be often that you have a straight up smoking gun where it's really clear in the, say, the homework problem you're working on or on the exam problems, it's like definitely there is bias in investigation or definitely there is bias in interpretation. But what I want you to do is to try to think creatively and imaginatively to be able to identify where there could be possible concern in bias in investigation or bias in interpretation. We want to anticipate possible risks here and then try to ameliorate them as best we can to try to minimize their distorting effect on our on our reasoning even if we don't have the smoking gun does that make sense chat so in your answers you can say things like well I'm not sure but maybe if this was going on this would be a problem for bias and investigation for example got a couple people type in here homework problems will definitely give you really good practice for this um, here while I'm waiting for for the messages to come in I might talk a little bit more here um, the like anticipating possible issues yes that's exactly right Colton that, that's what I want you to do um, Jaden asks, uh, so are there any clues or ways to attack other than just our thoughts? You got to use your thoughts. This is this is another part of the theme I mentioned yesterday about how inductive, uh, evaluating inductive reasoning always requires you to keep your brain turned on and to be sensitive to your background assumptions. Background assumptions about the world, how it works, how people work is always relevant to all of these evaluations. Um, on the on the homework and uh, well, I can say on the exam for these questions. Uh, I will, for this section of the exam that concerns statistical reasoning and the other inductive arguments, I will be giving you all of the criteria, so you don't have to have them memorized. I'll, I'll give you the list of sample size, sample bias, bias in investigation, bias in interpretation, and I'll ask you to evaluate the example argument given using those standards. And the big thing for grading these will come from how you explain yourself. It won't just be like you'll say, there is no, uh, sample size is good, no sample bias. I think there's bias in investigation and no bias in interpretation. That answer I can give almost no credit for. The, the way I'm going to be awarding credit is by looking at how you explain your evaluation. Because this stuff's always on a spectrum, remember? Um, it can be stronger, it can be weaker. And I'm looking for how you apply the principled standard to the scenario to kind of analyze it. And, and explaining your thinking and reasoning is how I'll you'll demonstrate to me that you know what that principle is about and how to use it in an actual case of analysis. Um, so that is definitely where you want to have your target uh, for your sort of mastery or competency with with this um, with with these problems with this skill. Yeah, Jose, you got a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Well, the, the key idea here in principle with sample size is bigger is better and, and smaller is weaker. And as long as I see that you know that, then that's great. And that's pretty straightforward. You don't, you don't have to do a lot to demonstrate to me that, that you want, you're grasping that, that is the, that's the thing that everything hinges on. But something like sample bias, that's going to take a lot more, right? Because it's more complicated to figure out how to evaluate that. Or say, now we're talking about bias and investigation, you'd have to identify to me what is the force or phenomenon that would cause concern here. Like in the one we were just doing with the instructor evals, um, you might be concerned about social pressure to, to you know, not give negative feedback or fear of reprisal. That, that would be an excellent way of demonstrating to me that you know what bias and investigation is all about. Um, so some of these are going to be more straightforward and some of them will be more complicated. Okay. So on this similar theme, bias and interpretation is tricky. And I wish the book did a little better job of this um, because they, they talk about prejudice and that's exactly right. But we want to be really clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about prejudice. So going back to my picture here, you'll notice I drew an arrow from bias and interpretation to this line between the data and then the property in question. So let's say we did, let's go back to that um, uh, scenario with the sociological study about sexual deviance. So you've designed a survey that's clever and sneaky so that you get data that's accurate. Um, that all the ways in which people might return answers to that survey questionnaire that would be a distorted picture of what's happening with them, you've protected against that. But in the process, the data doesn't speak directly to whether someone's in, a, in this kind of box or not in this box, that they're in this category, they have this property or they don't have this property. Um, you're gonna have to do some interpretation of the data to determine that. And it's at that stage of interpretation that things can maybe go wrong again. There's a, another risk of making a bad statistical generalization. Um, <clears throat> and the, the first thing that should be noted here when we're talking about something like prejudice, you know, prejudice is pre-judgment, that you've got assumptions or beliefs about what's going on with this phenomenon that are, that are pre-theoretical, they're pre-investigation, pre-observation, that are skewing the way that you understand what's happening once you do the investigation. That's the, the so you're sort of pre-judging the situation. That's the concern. But we gotta be really careful about that because if the, the, the recommendation here was don't have any preconceived notions about the thing you're studying when you do your observation, then not, that might eliminate the risk of prejudice and bias and interpretation, but it also completely eliminates any possible basis on which you can interpret the data to figure out what's going on. Any interpretation of data is going to rely on background assumptions, and so we can't be against background assumptions categorically. Um, the other way I can put this point is that in many, many cases of uh, statistical reasoning, the statistics don't speak for themselves. The data doesn't speak for itself. Uh, it, it does require some interpretive move. And that's why um, if you read professionally published sociological studies, they have not just the section of the paper that's about the study that they did, describing it, and showing the breakdown of the results that they got, but they have a massive amount of commentary about how they are interpreting it. What assumptions were they bringing to the analysis? Trying to defend those assumptions um, and, uh, and addressing the possible concern of how those assumptions could distort their interpretation of the data. Um, that's the kind of burden of proof shouldering that needs to happen to deal with this uh, because background assumptions, having some judgments coming into the study is important for the study to actually yield any actual fruit or insight. But here's where the line is drawn. So what, what separates doing that from something that could be rightfully called problematic prejudice? And here's, the, here's where I would define the line for you. So this is not something that's in the book, but this is my attempt to clarify this uh, in addition to what the book talks about, sort of supplementing it. I think the line is drawn here about whether those background assumptions you're using to interpret the data um, allow the data to speak in determining what conclusion we're going to draw as opposed to those background assumptions that are going to result in this conclusion no matter what the data said. So you can kind of imagine 
what if the data was different? If I used the background assumptions to inform this interpretation, would I come to a different result under some possible circumstances? In other words, is my judgment falsifiable? Is it possible that with different data I would come to a different result? If the answer is no, then you've got a problem. Then those background assumptions are prejudging the issue. And then in that case, it's like if, you're, if your background assumptions are just determining what you think about the sample, why did you even collect the data in the first place? Right? It's irrelevant at that point. We want to have background assumptions that empower the data to speak toward this issue rather than that override them. And I think that, that might be the core idea here. So um, this is a little tricky of a concept. So I definitely want to check in here with everyone in the chat and see how my description worked, whether that's making sense, whether you can see where that principled line is drawn. Um, how, how is this going? We've got some people typing. Again, it's, it's not always clear um, that there is uh, bias in interpretation, like you may not have a smoking gun, but you can talk about what sorts of things you might be concerned about. For example, if I'm the one who is, and this is, this is actually absolutely the case and something I always have to keep an eye on with these instructor evals, I get the data from the student responses, and then I have to interpret that. To, to try to get something out of it. Oh, did this student think I was doing a good job or a bad job? And because I have an ego and there's conflict of interest there, there's definitely a distinct risk of bias in interpretation that I might be interpreting the data in a way that's more favorable or, or paints me in a better light in what I'm determining about whether the students that were sampled, whether they thought I'm a good teacher or a bad teacher or, or on some particular issue. Um, that's always that, that's something that could be a risk in, that's on this level of how I'm taking this data and contextualizing it or interpreting it in order to come to this conclusion here. Um, Jose asked, do you think that the motivation to get the data can have bias and how does that play in? Um, the motivation to get the data, you mean like why we want to do the study in the first place, Jose? Okay. Um, absolutely. You can definitely be concerned about this. Um, take um, big tobacco companies funding research into whether smoking causes cancer, <laughs> right? Like that kind of scenario. Um, you probably want to have that study done independently rather than being done by big tobacco because we could be concerned about conflict of interest as a bias in interpretation with that data, for example. Um, but the, the way in which people can have motivations to even engage in statistical generalization in the first place is something that could cause bias on any of these levels. Um, they could cherry pick their sample or uh, use a method of investigation that's going to hide maybe things that are embarrassing or problematic for them. Um, there, there's an example. Uh, it looked like some people were typing something in and then deleted it. Uh, did, were there other questions here, or, or is some stuff maybe getting answered automatically as we keep going? I just want to check in. We okay? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing something pop up. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, so again, you kind of have to get creative here in thinking about where could something hijack this process? And if you, um, if you're, I think in terms of giving your the best answers for say something like the exam problems, distinguishing bias in investigation and interpretation is tricky, and the the line about how to separate them is by being sensitive to this way in which data mediates the the way in which I make a claim about what's happening with the sample. So bias in investigation will be about how we observe the sample and collect some data about it. And bias and interpretation would be the step of how I take that data and, and draw some kind of analytic conclusion about what's happening with the sample on the basis of it. That's where interpretation will show up. So that's what we got going on here. Um, I'm about to uh, go over here into, I'm going to erase this, um, and start talking about statistical applications. Because um, I want to get to that today too. <clears throat> 
So let's do here. Statistical applications um, should look kind of familiar from generalizations because we're going to still have a reference class and a smaller category. So we got reference class. And now we're going to, with the statistical application, we're going to call the smaller category the subset instead of calling it um, the sample, because we're not sampling anymore. Um, but uh, we're still going to have a claim here and a claim here about these two things. And then I'm also going to put another line in here to do that. It'll make it look like how it is in the book. Um, now with the statistical application, the direction of the inference is reversed. So with generalizations, put this up here. All right. So with generalizations, we were using a claim about the smaller category as the basis for drawing a conclusion about the larger category, the reference class. With an application, we're going in the opposite direction. Now we're going to use a claim. Woo. Now we're going to use a claim about the reference class as the basis for coming to some conclusion about what's happening with the subset. Okay, so I'm going from generalizations. Whoa, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I want to make a little therefore symbol here again. Now I'm using my generalized knowledge and applying it into a particular case in order to figure out uh, whether the subset has this feature or not. So the subset could be, again, one thing. It could be a whole grouping of things. Um, but it's it's going to be just something that's a smaller category embedded in this larger category. Let's use a really, really simple example. I talked about a bucket of marbles yesterday. Um, imagine you got a bucket of marbles that says, now with 80% blue marbles. If I reached into that bucket of marbles and I pulled out one marble at random, and I didn't look at it, I'd be in a position to make some informed judgment about whether that one marble that's in the bucket of marbles is blue. And I'd have some good reason for thinking it's blue. Odds are it's blue, we would say just informally, right? Um, so that that's the kind of reasoning we're using with statistical applications, that we are recognizing that there are general patterns that apply um, to what's happening in reality. And uh, we can use that to inform, to make predictions about what a particular subset of those generalized classes, what's going on with them. Here's another example I really like. Say first day of class. You came into the classroom. You saw me. And in college, you never know what you're going to get with instructors, right? Um, they could be good. They could be bad. You get, you get all kinds, right? And it might have been very salient to you to try to figure out as early as possible is this going to be a good class? Is this going to be a good teacher? And you don't have much to go off of yet. You know, you, you, your period for deciding whether you drop classes or stay in them is pretty short. Um, so you want to make the best judgment you can. So let's have the subset be me. And the question is, do I have the property in question? Am I a good teacher? And you don't have to answer this or anything, but <laughs> just think about this as a general scenario. Um, you might try to get some insight onto M. Here, I'm actually going to put a little like question mark here. You, know, you might be wondering, is Tim a good teacher or not, or any of the teachers you meet on the first day? So the the concern is about figuring out something about this subset. Does it have this claimed feature or not? And you might be thinking about some things that you notice about me, some things that are true of me that put me into a category of other instructors. Um, I don't, maybe just for fun here, let's say you knew I was a Star Trek fan. So I was wearing like a Star Trek hat. So Tim is in the category of being instructors that like Star Trek. And then you might think about past experience and be like, okay, what percentage of the instructors I've had that like Star Trek turn out to be good instructors? And then to use that as the basis for making, a, again, a fallible but still informed judgment about whether I'm a good teacher or not. Okay? So that's a model of how statistical applications work. Like all inductive argumentation, they're fallible. When you make statistical generalizations, 
you're not um, you're not this is an infallible way of coming up to determinations about the reference class there's a lot of ways things can go wrong here um, but you can still have some reason to think that the reference class has something going on based on the observations you've made of the sample same thing here based on what you know about reference classes that can inform or give you some evidence for a judgment about what's happening with the subset how are we doing so far uh, people want to ask questions anything clarify what I'm talking about just for what a statistical application is and the sort of general logic or strategy of what we're trying to do with it those those illustrations working for you Hello? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Working for you? Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? Even just saying I'm cool is helpful. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Okay. Looks like it's going good. Oh, for the... Okay, so Jaden's asking... Thank you for the responses, everyone. Um, Jaden's asking, for the example, wouldn't that be a sample bias? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what you mean. Uh, the example of me uh, with the uh, instructors who like Star Trek... Okay, okay. There is going to be a problem with that, potentially, um, but we'll talk about that with the standards of evaluation, which I'm about to get into. Yeah. Need more review? Uh, Kevin, if, if there's something I can do to help right now, I'd love to do it. A um, few more examples would be welcome. Okay. Um, so, here's another example I can provide. All right. So... I'm, I, I don't have a car. I don't drive. I don't have a driver's license. I take the bus everywhere. And uh, bus schedules are very important to me. And knowing when a bus is going to arrive is kind of a crucial thing. And I've got apps and stuff for that. But sometimes the app is weird. And I need to maybe rely on my experience. So I might know that the 554, as a general reference class, all buses that are the 554 bus have a... 90% chance of being on time. Um, or actually, let's do something a little different. Let's say I, uh, there's some other buses that are less reliable than the 554. Um, let, but let's just say the, the 554 was actually pretty unreliable. So let's, let's say 70% um, of the time the bus is five minutes late. Okay, so I know as a, as a general matter that of this reference class, all instances of the 554 buses running that, what did I just say? A, 80%? I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Let's say 80% of the time, the bus is five minutes late. So then the subset could be like the bus today. When, I take, uh, when I'm trying to catch the 554 today, that's one instance of the general reference class of 554s. And I'm going to I'm gonna project or um, predict that this bus is going to be five minutes late might be relevant if I'm like, am I gonna, if I go now, am I going to hit it in time or am I going to miss it? Right? That might be why I care about this. Um, but I could use my general knowledge about how the 554 runs to make an informed judgment about whether this instance today of the 554 bus is at this particular part of the day, whether that one's going to be late. Does that example help? Yep, cool. Okay, okay. Now, there's one really important thing I want to talk about. Oh, uh, is statistical application that one that is like stereotyping? So if I say Americans are loud, so Tim is loud, is that an application? Yes. Um, that's the use of a stereotype, Jose. Um, stereotypes are also relevant here for statistical generalizations because it's like, where do they come from? Well, the stereotype would be the claim about the reference class that maybe has been formed on the basis of a sample and probably that generalization is weak because it's not meeting these standards in a very good way. Okay? But once you've got the stereotype, when you apply it to someone, then you're engaged in a statistical application. Yes, that's, that, it would count. It would maybe be bad, but it would count. Um, one thing I want to point out, I, I mentioned before, uh, earlier this week, that in the exam, you'll be asked to 
distinguish between a generalization and an application. And you might be thinking that this percentage is sort of the, the key difference between the two. And I want to tell you, it's not. In the examples we talked about with statistical generalizations, the, a, a percentage could be a part of the property in question, property X. Like we could say 60% of voters in this area that we polled um, approve of additional gun control, so therefore all the voters in this area, not just the ones we polled, 60% of them approve of additional gun control or something like that, right? You could have a percentage embedded in the content of this property X. So if you see a problem and it has a percentage, you can't jump to the conclusion that it's a statistical application. It's just that every statistical application will talk about a certain ratio of the reference class which has the claimed feature. That's going to be a structural element of applications. The way to determine the difference between a generalization and an application is to look at the direction of the inference. You've got to figure out what's the conclusion and what's the premise. If the conclusion is about the reference class, it's a generalization. If the conclusion is about the smaller subset class, then it's an application. And that's the real difference here. Okay, we've got a few minutes left here, um, and I want to use it to introduce, there are only two standards of evaluations for applications, and I want to at least talk about them in brief today, and then we can talk more about them tomorrow uh, if necessary. Um, I'm just going to put this as, how is the percentage doing? That's kind of informal language here, but the, the standard here is that and this is, this is kind of straightforward, uh, much more straightforward standard, more like sample size for the generalization. Um, if this percentage of the reference class is really close to 100 or to 0, then you're going to have a strong statistical application. The closer it is to 50-50, the weaker the application is as an inductive inference. So let's go back to the really simple example of the bucket of marbles. If, if I said... Um, 50% of the mar like the label on the outside of the bucket says 50% of the marbles in this bucket are blue then if you so that's what's going on 50% of the reference class has the property in question being blue then if I try to pull out one marble the subset and say is it blue or not well it's just a coin flip right I have I have just as much reason for thinking that it's blue as I have for thinking that it's not blue so I can't, I'm not in a good position to, to make an application judgment here. But if the percentage was like 99% blue marbles, well then I definitely can draw the conclusion, you now I'm in a really good spot, I'm in a, a strong, I have strong evidence to think that the marble I pull out at random is going to be blue. But likewise, if the percentage was like 1%, if 1% of the marbles in the bucket were blue, then that's a really good basis for thinking that a marble I pull out is not blue. Okay, so it's a little reversed when you've got low percentages, um, but they're they're also going to be really good a really good basis for coming to a determination about the subset. Um, is that making sense, chat? That feeling good? The core idea is just being able to when you're you know typing up your answers and sending to me for the exam. The key thing will be to demonstrate that you know that having it close to 100 or 0 is good, and 50-50 is bad. That's weak. Okay, looks like that's doing good. Um, one other thing that's a good note here on this one is... Um, <laughs> thanks, Nathan. Um, another good thing to note here is that you're going to have statistical applications in the real world that don't give you a percentage. They don't give you a number. We have a lot of informal phrases, like most. Most is the worst. Super ambiguous. Is it, it, most could mean 51%, it could mean 99%, and everything in between. So it's really hard to tell there with just the word most. Um, but something like almost all, or next to none, or something like that, that's a little bit more helpful. And you can still, uh, if you have a problem like that on the exam, you can still indicate to me in your analysis that you understand what's happening with this standard of evaluation and what would be strong and what would be weaker. That's the main thing that we're trying to learn in this class is just what are the variables that affect the strength of these arguments. Um, so that, that's the big thing here. Um, sometimes this won't be a number. Uh, another thing I always like to say about uh, uh, 
statistical reasoning in general is that sometimes we idolize numbers and think that they have more rational weight just because there's numbers involved, uh, almost like they're a magic spell or something. And they're not. Um, the they're if you if you're given something like 55.7 percent, you know that that may not mean you should buy this argument just because of you you had a, a decimal in there and stuff like that. We got to think about the context for how we're evaluating that, and that's where standard number two is going to come in and be very very relevant. So, with st uh, standard number two, we're asking about the relevance of the reference class. That is the big thing we need to talk about with standard number two. So Jaden says, yeah, but what about um, statistical applications that have bias, like your Star Trek teacher example? With stats or subsets of a reference class that have nothing to do with the conclusion, what bias would that be? That's the standard, the relevance of the reference class. That's what we're going to be talking about here, or that's what we're going to be concerned about here. And this is the one that's much trickier. How the percentage is doing, this is much more straightforward. Um, when you're doing your exam answers, this probably won't take very long. This one's going to require a lot more careful thinking. And I've got a really nice way of setting this up. Um, so I want to give that to you right now in the next couple minutes, and then I know i got to let you go, and we can talk about this a little bit more tomorrow. But the, the key framing for why this matters is think about how the subset is not just a member of one reference class, but actually could be a member of many different reference classes. There's a lot of different things that we could have looked at instead of the reference class that was cited to gain insight on whether the subset has the claimed feature or not. So if, if we had more time here, I could ask you, like, when you're thinking about, you know, that first day of class and whether a teacher is going to be a good one or a bad one, what are the variables that speak to that judgment for you? What do you think is relevant? What, what could you observe about the teacher that would you think be an indicator of whether they're going to be a good teacher or not? The whole focus here with an application is on the subset, whether it has the claimed feature or not. Which thing do we want to use as the guide for determining that? And this is, um, this is where the phenomenon of statistical cherry picking usually shows up. That people pick a reference class that just has a really nice percentage that's close to 100 or 0 that speaks in favor of the conclusion that they want to draw. That would be total bias, right? Um, that that reference class may not be the most relevant reference class for the subset. Um, code word today is garbage truck, because in my last class uh, I had a garbage truck show up and make an annoyance of itself. So garbage truck is the code word for today. Um, thank you for asking, Nathan. Good to get that in there. Uh, again, uh, garbage truck is, is the code word. Okay, so picking the relevance of the reference class will be important. In the example I offered, maybe you think being a Star Trek fan is not that relevant to being a good teacher, um, and that we could have chosen much better reference classes instead that would have spoken more heavily to it. When I did this lecture before, I had a student be like, oh, he has a comb over. <laughs> I was like, is that, is that a really big deal breaker, deal maker for whether a teacher is going to be good or not? Um, you know, that kind of thing. But um, uh, I'm not that young anymore, but in earlier years when I taught this class, they were like, oh, you were young. So, you know, in my experience, younger teachers are a little bit better. So I thought that was a relevant reference class. This is, again, going to require your background assumptions. Um, and you'll want to think creatively about maybe this reference class that was offered was pretty good, but maybe there's a better one. And another key thing I want to just po point out in closing, everything that's in red here uh, is about the evaluation, but it's also things that you won't get in the problem. So if you're given a statistical application to evaluate, you're not going to be given a whole host of other options for reference classes that could have been chosen instead. All you'll get is the one that was actually used in the argument. So you're going to have to use your own imagination, your own background assumptions about the world, to try to think of what might be better ones, and then offer those. That's a great way to explain your answer. If you think the reference class is not the most relevant, try to come up with one that you think would be better. And that would be a great way to explain your answer. Okay, um, I feel like I probably need to let you go. I don't know if other people have classes they need to get to uh, or anything else like that. Um, but if you want to uh, talk a little bit more here, I can definitely hang on um, and uh, answer questions. Uh, we'll, we can do more review with statistical applications 
um, tomorrow too before moving on to our next unit. Um, but uh, there you go. That's that's class today. Anything you want to ask about? You're welcome. You're welcome. You're you're very welcome. Uh, the code word was garbage truck. Take care. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. It's funny, Alex, that you say it's straightforward because we're in inductive argument mode. So everything's kind of fuzzy and goofy. <laughs> but there, there are the, the principles that we've got to work with can um, really help with clarifying things that are pretty sticky and fuzzy. Oh, Alex left already. Dang. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop the video now.